Hello and welcome to this lecture in Kansas and local history. This is going to be a somewhat different type of lecture as opposed to the other lectures that have been in this course in that I'm really going to be talking as much about uh, folklore and, and science as I'm going to be talking about history. But I do think this is one of those topics which not only do people find interesting, but I think really is a way of getting at what it means to be a Kansan and what it means to be a citizen or uh, someone who lives on the Great Plains. And uh, I think that, and folklorists work on these these kinds of issues all the time. That is the way that peoples d come to distinguish themselves from other people by the stories that they tell. And part of what the subtext of today's lecture will be is that Kansans and more generally people on the Great Plains come to identify themselves as being distinct from other people in the United States and around the world because of the way they interact with Plains weather and in this case most specifically with the fearsome phenomena that we call the tornado. As uh, some of you may know, not only am I a, a historian, but I'm also a storm chaser and so this topic, this lecture, is the result of me marrying those two things together, my interest in history and my interest in severe weather. And so periodically through here there will be of course lots of photographs from the past, but also I will occasionally sprinkle in some of my own photographs, including the one you see here. All right, so the background here is I, I think that Kansans uh, have come to embrace severe weather and tornadoes as being just part of the package of being a Kansan. And of course, this has been amplified by the constant showings of the film Wizard of Oz, which of course opens with this tornado sweeping across the Kansas Plains and taking Dorothy Gale to the magical, colorful world of Oz. But if you look at descriptors of Kansas in national magazines and publications and newspapers, you know, long before The Wizard of Oz becomes a film, there is already the association of Kansas with tornadoes, with cyclones, as they were called in the late 19th century. Uh, and we'll, we'll see partially that this is due to some well-publicized tornado outbreaks, which happened in the state of Kansas. But the larger point I'm trying to make today is that this association of tornadoes in Kansas is actually more strong than the actual frequency of tornadoes would suggest. So that what's going on here is a kind of a cultural adaptation to the Great Plains environment and Kansans to some degree taking on willingly uh, th this kind of weather and this kind of phenomena as being a marker of distinctiveness that helps distinguish Plains people and Kansans uh, from other people in the United States. Back here. Fortunately, and of course many of you who have friends and family from around the country will be asked periodically how can you live in Kansas and how can you face these terrible tornadoes and as we're going to see thankfully tornadoes are pretty rare phenomena in the state of Kansas and of course your response back to the, those people might be if you're in California how can you live with earthquakes if you are on the Gulf Coast how can you live with hurricanes and the like. All right. Uh, my interest in taking this issue from just being a hobby to something of serious historical consideration was triggered by my coming across this particular commemorative magazine uh, in the Kansas State Historical Society archives. On September 25th, 1973, shortly after four in the afternoon, there was an outbreak of tornadoes in north central Kansas and then extending up into Nebraska. A uh, particularly hard hit were several counties in north central Kansas where tornadoes were later rated as F3s and F4s on the Fujita tornado damage scale. These tornadoes killed 13 people, injured 46 others. The town of Clay Center took a direct hit resulting in over 2.5 million dollars in damage and 22 injuries, many of which were actually at a local hospital. 
What oftentimes happens in the wake of large destructive tornadoes is you have the publication of magazines or books uh, with photographs and stories told by survivors about uh, about the event. If you look on eBay and just type in tornado book or tornado magazine, you will find dozens of these for sale by various antique dealers. In the case of the Clay Center tornado, this magazine's cover was crowned with a title, quote, the Indian was wrong. And I immediately knew what this meant, and some of you, particularly if you're older, listening to this lecture may also understand what this is about. What the magazine's title was referring to when it claimed that, quote, the Indian was wrong was a, a myth about tornadoes common among many Plains communities then and even today. That is, that certain places are invulnerable to tornadoes because of topography, because of a hill, because of a river, and people know this to be true because, quote-unquote, the old Indian said so at the time of the settlement of that town sometime in the 19th century. In the case of Clay Center, the story went that an old Indian had said that Clay Center could never be hit due to the rolling terrain nearby. And there are all sorts of these what I call topographic myths uh, about this, this feature or that feature protecting town X or Y from tornadoes. And I'm going to explore this now, and this will get us to this notion of how Kansans today uh, have come to culturally embrace certain ideas uh, about tornadoes. Now, again, these topographical stories are everywhere. The most famous example of this story, though, in, in Kansas, it comes from Topeka, uh, the legend of Burnett's Mound. And here's a photograph from the top of that mound. Uh, the story went uh, that a Potawatomi Indian chief by the name of Abraham Burnett said to early settlers uh, in, in and around Topeka, that as long as the mound, which is on the southwest side of modern-day Topeka, that as long as this mound was undisturbed and the burial places of his people on it were undisturbed, that this mound would somehow protect Topeka from any tornadoes coming from the west. Here's a picture of Burnett and actually a picture of the uh, gravestone at the site where he is buried. Um, so Burnett was a real person. But we don't have any evidence of Burnett actually saying these things when he was alive. Uh, and more to the point, other parts of the story break down. Uh, there really aren't Potawatomi's buried on top of Burnett's mound. Uh, but over the decades after Topeka was settled, while there were tornadoes which touched down to damage on the outskirts of Topeka, uh, there really was no tornado that went through the middle of town. And so over, over time, somehow, this story became accepted as fact, even against the objections of meteorologists who came to work at Topeka's National Weather Service office, including distinguished meteorologists like, uh, like Snowden Flora. Now, predictably, what happened was, on June 8, 1966, the tornado you see here came into Topeka, went right over Burnett's Mound, and came into Topeka uh, doing serious damage to Washburn University, throwing debris up onto the side of the Capitol Dome, and this tornado killed 16 people, and it was uh, rated ultimately an F5 on the Fujita damage scale of 0 to 5. So what about the mound, right? The story was the mound would somehow keep Topeka safe. Well, in the wake of this tornado, there were apparently some fairly serious conversations about this question. And what some people in Topeka came to believe is that the problem was not that the mound had somehow failed, but that the mound's magic had been corrupted by the building of a water tower on the top of Burnett's Mound, which then somehow diminished the mound's magical power to protect Topeka. These topographical stories may sound silly to you, and they, they really, I think, they should, but they are ubiquitous, and you can still hear them. 
Tulsa has a story like this. Emporia did too before it was hit by a tornado back in the early 1970s. Lawrence, Kansas to this day has a variation of this theme arguing that somehow the Kansas River will keep Lawrence from being hit by a tornado despite the fact that downtown Lawrence was hit by a tornado uh, back in the 19-teens and the southern parts of Lawrence were hit back in 1981 and then again in 2000, I believe 2003. Uh, another example of one of one of these topographical myths that was disproven by a tornado uh, happens in Woodward, Oklahoma, back in 1947, uh, when an F5 tornado uh, went through Woodward and killed 107 people in Woodward alone. The legend in Woodward, Oklahoma, was that uh, it was supposed to be protected because it was down in a valley of sorts, uh, a wide, flat bowl bracketed by hills. A survivor of that event named George Getzinger later went to Oklahoma A&M, and in a, a book he later wrote, Getzinger later wrote, that, quote, his Oklahoma classmates related virtually identical tales of how their town was protected from tornadoes by proximity to some hill or mountain, end quote. And all of these stories had as their original attribution some early Indian uh, elder who told the settlers that these topographical features would keep them safe. Uh, Getzinger later wrote, and I quote, they, that same damn Indian must have gone all over the country lying to everybody, end quote. Well, judging from the ubiquity of these Indian legends in Kansas communities and other communities across the plains, you can sort of understand Getzinger's frustration. But as a historian, you know, I wanted to know where these things came from, and why did they, and why do they still persist? And they still do persist today. Uh, I think about a time I was storm chasing probably 15 years ago now, and I was up in southeastern Nebraska. My car's serpentine belt uh, went broke, and so I had to get it repaired, and I sort of limped into this artifact of small town life, the combination feed lot and auto, not feed lot, feed store and auto repair uh, place. And there were lots of old farmers and they were having coffee and they saw me come in and they asked me what I was doing there because clearly I was from out of town. And I told them I was storm chasing and my car needed to be repaired. And they all kind of looked at me and said, oh son, you're in the wrong place. We never get tornadoes here because we have rivers on both sides of town and they keep us safe. So these stories are still out there. But as a historian, I wanted to know, okay, where are these the topographical myths really come from? Um, because, and by the way, just to, just to be clear about this, rivers, hills, ridges, that feature prominent in all these stories, they have absolutely no impact on where tornadoes do or don't go. Tornadoes are violently rotating columns of air that are tens of thousands of feet tall, uh, which, and so as a result, the actual topographical feature of a ridge or a river that would have two or three hundred feet of vertical relief will have no impact at all on what a tornado does or doesn't do. Okay, having set that aside though, as the historian, I'm interested where do these stories really come from? Did they really come from Indians? And, and then why do people hold on to them over time? Well, from what I can tell, these stories do not actually come from Native Americans themselves. In other words, they don't really appear to be uh, Native Americans in Kansas telling early settlers that this or that, that place will be safe from tornadoes because of this ridge or that river. Now, this is not to say that Native Americans are not talking about tornadoes, because they certainly are. But what one finds in the anthropological literature is that Native Americans were talking about tornadoes in the same ways that Native Americans talked about other natural phenomena. If you think back to uh, one of the early lectures in this class, we talked about how Native Americans saw the universe as being full of various consciousnesses, which were expressions of various aspects of nature. And for Native American tribes, severe weather, lightning, thunder, tornado uh, were all examples of this, and these manifestations of nature could, through ritual and ceremony, uh, be communicated with. 
Uh, now, the, the group that was in Kansas that I found the, the most information about regarding this topic would be the Kiowa. The Kiowa at the time of early white settlement were ranging from southern Kansas down into Oklahoma. And the Kiowa have several stories of interest here. Uh, most notably is one involving tornado. Tornado in the Kiowa language would be called Mankaya. The story goes something like this, and there are variations of this story. Um, and Scott Mamaday wrote about one version of this story in his book, Way to Rainy Mountain. Uh, the famous uh, anthropologist James Mooney um, has several other uh, p examples of this, which uh, he gathered over time. Uh, distilling his various versions down to the core, here's how the story goes. Uh, Kiowa shaman were uh, approached by other Kiowa leaders because the Kiowa were running out of horses. The shaman said, no, no, no problem, we can actually uh, create more horses uh, through ritual and ceremony and infuse them with the, the power of, of the universe. And so the story goes that the shaman took uh, Oklahoma red dirt and clay and formed these horses and then through ceremony began to try to infuse them with this magical power and in all these stories then uh, these horses began to move and began to grow and began to ascend into the sky beyond the powers of their creators and ascended above the clouds until all that could be seen were their bushy tails sweeping the ground right those would be tornado. And so this is the sky horse or the storm horse that brings the tornado, Mankaya. And oftentimes the story ends with the line, the Kiowa are not afraid of Mankaya because Mankaya understands their language. Another variation of this story, um, or these kinds of stories, comes from the Kiowa and a trickster character in their cosmology uh, called Sane Day. And uh, in one story, Sane Day, uh, who was always on the prowl for sexual conquests, uh, spies a woman sitting on the ground and found her attractive. So the story goes, Sane Day uh, says to her, hey, I'd like to marry you. And uh, Whirlwind Woman, who is the name of the, the woman he comes across, refuses by saying, you do not want me. I do not stay in one place. I travel all around all the time. I go here and there. Uh, Saint Day himself, so the story goes, thought this no real problem and convinced Whirlwind Woman to marry him. She told him that that would be fine, but she, uh, that, she, that he should put his arms around her and then once he did so, she began to whirl around with great force, at which point Saint Day began to grow sick. He complained and demanded to be let go, and that was the end of the marriage. My point here is that I cannot, of course, say that no Native American uh, never said to a early white settler that perhaps this or that place might be safe, but th the preponderance of the evidence that one finds in the anthological literature is that Native Americans, when they're talking about tornadoes, are talking about them in a way that is very different than this very kind of instrumental, this is how you are safe from them. Rather, uh, this is how you their stories are about the, their very nature, their interactions with people, and that tornadoes are, like other parts of nature, uh, animate, that one can communicate with them through the proper ritual and ceremony. This is a very different kind of story than settle here, this hill or this river will keep you safe from them. Okay, so if Native Americans are not the source of these topographical myths and legends, then where do they come from? And, and by the way, when you look at newspaper coverage of big tornado events on the Great Plains in, late, in the mid to late 19th century, you oftentimes have the newspaper editors talking about the theory of the day as to why tornadoes do what they do. And you find very few examples of these topographical stories being associated with Indians back in these newspaper articles from the late 19th century. Now, what you do find are lots of interesting observations and pseudoscientific theories. 
And so in my own research, that after discovering that Native Americans were in all likelihood not the true source of these topographical stories, I began to ask, okay, so what about what I am finding in newspaper articles from the 19th century? What I find, again, are observations in pseudoscience. And I'm going to center my conversations here around a series of tornadoes that happened in north central Kansas uh, on May 30th, 1879 that actually have a fairly important role in meteorology more generally in the United States. Now as I go through all of this, remember a couple of things. First of all, thankfully, even in Kansas, tornadoes are fairly rare phenomena. Um, the data sets are changing now that there are more storm chasers out there documenting every single tornado in ways that weren't done 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but tornadoes are rare, so that you have less than one tornado per county per year in Kansas. Also remember the way that we perceive the world matters here a great deal, particularly in the 19th century when one doesn't have radar, one doesn't have good maps, one doesn't have uh, good data sets to look at, and when most people perceive the world as here versus there. And, and this, this, this may sort of seem overly simplistic, but bear with me. Which of the two categories, here or there, is larger? The answer is there, because here is easily definable. Here is, the pl here is the place you are. Here is the place you care about. It's your farm. It's your town. Maybe it's your county. There, by definition, is every place else. So one should not be surprised that here gets hit by tornadoes much less often than there. And in the 19th century, when, again, exact data about where these things happen is somewhat fuzzy, there could be one mile to your north, five miles to your north, ten miles to your north, or twenty miles to your north to you. It's What that all means is the tornado did not hit here, it went to the north. They always seem to go to the north, don't they? I wonder why. And so settlers began to, based upon their own understandable observations, try to figure out why did here never get hit, but there always did. Why did they always seem to go north? when that going north could be one mile away, five miles away, 20 miles away, 30 miles away. And in the 19th century, the late 19th century, people of course placed themselves in the mental landscape, their mental landscape, and on the physical landscape by talking about physical features. So if you were a settler um, in Douglas County, Kansas, right, in the 1860s, you would have on your mental map of Douglas County features like the Wakarusa River, or the Kansas River, or Hogback Ridge, which later becomes renamed Mount Oread, and that is where KU is located. If you place yourself in the landscape by topographical features in the 19th century, it's not at all then surprising that people began to wonder whether or not those topographical features are explaining why tornadoes always seem to hit there versus here. Why they always go north and never hit here. It's really all about probabilities, what this is really about. But the way people perceived it is that here never gets hit, there always does, and why is that? Maybe it is the river. Maybe it's that ridge and those become the topographical stories. Now when I make this conclusion, understand I'm not trying to make fun of early settlers by calling them stupid or naive. This is what their observations are leading them to conclude. They also have a very strong sense of a need to feel safe from tornadoes, and thus this is a kind of the explanation that makes people feel more comfortable with the Great Plains, and it is a kind of psychological adaptation to the plains. Now all of this plays out in interesting ways um, after this big outbreak of tornadoes uh, on May 30th, 1879. Here on the right hand side you have a map of the various tornado tracks, for, actually for both May 29th and May 30th, but the big tornadoes that we'll be talking about in a moment happened on May 30th, 
Uh, dozens of, of Kansans were killed. This is actually even mentioned briefly in Sod and Stubble, uh, that there's a brief discussion of a tornado that almost wipes out Irving, Kansas. Now, in the wake of these tornadoes, there is lots of discussion in newspapers, not just in Kansas, but across the country, about why these tornadoes did what they did. And so lots of the prevailing ideas of the day about tornadoes uh, can then be uh, taken from those articles. Also, these tornadoes were so significant, there was an article in the Scientific American magazine about them, and the country's most... Um, I shouldn't say famous, that's the wrong word, uh, but the country's uh, best tornado researcher, John P. Finley of the U.S. Signal Corps, which will eventually become the Weather Service, uh, comes and studies this event and writes about them extensively in a, in a published uh, government report about them. So if you look at all this, you get a pretty good sense as to what people think about how tornadoes are are supposed to be behaving uh, in the, by the time we're in the 1870s. You get a sense of the state of the science, in other words. And what you discover is there are a lot of sci pseudo-scientific theories out there which did actually, what they did is they tended to confirm the observations of locals that small-scale topographical features actually mattered and could change tornado behavior. Here, by the way, is, uh, is Finley. He wrote several books about tornadoes and is arguably the, the really the first, in my mind, serious uh, tornado scientist in American history. You see one of his maps on the left-hand side uh, of one of the big tornadoes in 1879, the one in particular uh, that devastated the town of Irving. But in the wake of, again, these tornadoes, lots of articles for a historian like me to read and lots of interesting things. Um, I came across a gentleman named John Tice, who taught at Washington University in St. Louis. He called himself the Weather Wizard. That's kind of the name you might expect that a weakened meteorologist might give himself to try to get TV ratings today. Uh, but John Tice had some very strong ideas about tornadoes, and the 1879 event actually led some people in Kansas to write to Tice. Tice was well known as a so-called tornado expert. And one concerned citizen from Waterville, Kansas, uh, wrote Professor Tice, and uh, was concerned that Waterville, while it was more or less missed uh, in 1879, uh, sh this woman was concerned that Waterville would be hit later. and. John Tice responds to this understandably concerned woman that, quote, Oh, madam, you have nothing to worry about, because the high hills south and southwest from your town will protect it, as very few tornadoes are in contact with the earth for any great distance. Generally, they bound along like a ball. So the high hill would protect. Ah, but Waterville was doubly protected, Tice said. If one should come in from the west or northwest, it will take to the Blue River and follow its general direction. Because, apparently, tornadoes liked to take to water. Now, putting aside the questions here of consistency uh, about what Tice is saying, about tornadoes behaving certain ways around certain features, the larger point is, here we have a so-called scientist from a respected university adding legitimacy to the importance of these ideas that local topographic features mattered in explaining tornado behavior. Okay? So he's, this is the expert. You know, Finley, by the way, um, oh, after his study of these 1879 tornadoes, came to conclude that topography didn't matter one bit. But people embraced Tice's ideas because they reinforced the ideas and observations they were making themselves. There were other ideas out there floating around at the same time, too. Electricity. Uh, there was a gentleman named Ted Weissman out of Lawrence, Kansas, who self-published a book arguing uh, that tornadoes were somehow related to sunspot activity and uh, that electric fields in the atmosphere helped determine where tornadoes went. Uh, Tice himself, actually, later concluded uh, in a letter that one reason 
uh, I think it was Irving. One reason why, not Irving, Delphos, I'm sorry. While Delphos, Kansas was hit by those tornadoes was because of the recent laying down of a telegraphic line and that tornadoes uh, would follow that electric line. Uh, Finley, and I can sort of see him having some, some pleasure in this, uh, Finley later disputed this by pointing out that that telegraphic line going into Delphos, Kansas was only really on a map and had yet to actually be built at the time of that tornado. In any case, these the sort of pseudo pseudoscientific ideas were out there, and that's really the point I'm trying to get at. Remember, you know, the late 19th century is also the period of this rain falls the plow stuff that we talked about in this class that railroads used to try to encourage can people to come settle in Kansas and to dispel the idea of the Great American Desert. The point being, meteorology um, is a very primitive science in the late 19th century. Remember, we don't really even understand the jet stream or really even encounter it uh, until World War II when you have high altitude bombers flying west across the Pacific Ocean and discovering a somewhat unexpected uh, 150 knot headwind. And remember, motivated reasonings at work here too. People could take comfort in the notion that topography would save them and their towns would be safe. And so ideas that reinforced that were more easily and enthusiastically embraced than John Finley's uh, ideas that, oh, by the way, topography does not help, does not protect you. Your real protection is that tornadoes are thankfully rare. rare. Uh, probability is not something that people really want to trust when it comes to violent phenomena like tornadoes. Also remember that the first real tornado forecast is not till 1948 down at Tinker Air Force Base in o Oklahoma City. Um, the story there is classic, I think, old school military. Uh, the two weather forecasters for the Air Force Base uh, two majors named Fallbush and Miller were called in by their commanding officer after a tornado had done some damage to the base, Tinker Air Force Base, and the commander said, uh, it is your duty to inform me the next time this will happen. These forecasters look at each other with some confusion because no one had really put together a, I mean, Finley had tried, but no one really had put together a classic list of what a tornado forecast would look like. And within two weeks of this initial tornado hit, Fallbush and Miller had developed a list of sort of criteria. Um, instability, uh, wind fields aloft, a variety of complicated meteorological factors. And two weeks uh, after that first tornado event, 1948, Fallbush and Miller had a day in which all of their criteria were met. They went to their commander and said, um, Sir, maybe today. And in an event which truly does defy the odds, uh, Tinker Air Force Base was visited again by a tornado. Not a direct hit, but by a tornado. Um, the, the point being here that this is the first true tornado forecast um, in American history. That's 1948. That's not that long ago when you think about uh, the track record of other fields of science. So we're still learning. And here's some examples of how we're still learning. Um, if you, in the 1970s or even to the early 80s, you might have heard this as a kind of advice if you live in the Great Plains as to what to do when a tornado comes. You might have heard the idea that you're supposed to open a window. Uh, the idea there was that tornadoes did most of the damage because of explosive decompression. That air pressure inside a tornado was so low that it would cause houses to explode. And so if you opened your windows, you would actually then lead to uh, a less explosive kind of decompression when a tornado moved over a house. Well, that of course isn't the way it works. Um, you Damage is caused by just strong winds inside a tornado. We now know those winds max out 
probably somewhere around 230 240 miles an hour and wind speeds of that strength when they're blowing around bricks and things can demolish a home quite easily without having to worry about any kind of explosive decompression we now know because of uh, some some uh, readings that have been taken that pressure inside a tornado is low but it's not low enough to cause your house to explode uh, another thing you might have heard uh, was that you should get into the southwest corner of your basement. That's the safest part of your basement. This was an idea that actually came from John Finley, uh, based upon some of the examination of, uh, of those homes in Kansas in the wake of that 1879 tornado. That idea has been, at least in the scientific literature, overturned. Uh, partially due to an investigation of the damage path of the 1966 Topeka tornado that was done by Joe Eagleman, who was a meteorology professor at the University of Kansas. He discovered there was a fair amount of debris that got tossed into the southwest corner of a basement. So now the consensus is, yes, get in your basement, but get under something. Get under a stairwell, get under um, a frame of some sort, and certainly stay away from any exterior walls in your basement. Uh, more recently, this is again also is Kansas. Uh, people may have seen video from the 1991 Andover Kansas event that one could survive a tornado if you got under an overpass. That video was out there all by, by the mid to late 1990s and uh, unfortunately people saw that video and began to act on it. Uh, in 1999 when an F5 tornado went to Moore, Oklahoma, there were people hiding under overpasses 20 minutes before that tornado arrived, and they died. Being under an overpass is not really a safe place to be. If you think about debris being thrown at high speeds up under an overpass, um, that's not a place you want to be. Now, here's a, another idea about sort of this perception and culture when it involves tornadoes. Tornado Alley itself. Supposedly, we here in Kansas live in Tornado Alley. And you'll see different maps of where Tornado Alley is supposed to be. Here's one example on the left. But on the right, you see an example, uh, uh, not an example, you see data of tornado activities in the United States between 1950 and 2006 of EF3, EF4, and EF5 tornadoes. Those are the tornadoes that do the most damage and cause the most deaths. You see that that blob is much larger than the blob that we call Tornado Alley. On the left, thus, then we have perception. On the right, we have reality. And that perception on the left is why when you talk to your friends or family across the country, they ask you, how can you stand to live there? Aren't you afraid of tornadoes, as opposed to on the right, when you should perhaps be having those same conversations with people who live in Illinois or Indiana or Alabama? So this is the point that I'm trying to make. That there's something cultural going on here in terms of the identification of the Great Plains and Kansas with tornadoes that goes beyond the actual data. Now, to be clear, there have been events in Kansas that are notable. But in the overall scheme of things, particularly if you look at the deadliest tornadoes in American history, not that many of them have actually taken place in Kansas. Now, the deadliest tornado in Kansas history was this one. This takes place in uh, Udall, Kansas, uh, east of Wichita, May 25th, 1955. Eighty people die. This tornado happened um, late at night, uh, approximately 10.29 p.m. And you can see the kind of horrible destruction done to the town on the right. That used to be, a, uh, I'm assuming, a truck frame that's wrapped around a tree. You just imagine the kind of force it took to do that. One positive thing that did come from the Udall tornado was that the National Weather Service uh, began holding public storm spotter training courses 
uh, one year later. The first one in the entire country was held on March 8, 1959 in Wellington, Kansas. Again, inspired by the relative lack of warning uh, that came to Udall on the night of May 25th. This is a tornado that you may have seen a footage of before. Uh, this is the Andover tornado down in north of Wichita on April 26, 1991. I think the death toll for that tornado was 19, many of which were in the Golden Spur trailer park. And this was a violent tornado. You can tell that um, by the debris being lofted into the air here. If you go to YouTube and type Andover Tornado, you can find uh, lots of examples of video which show just how violent that tornado was. It was clearly an F5 on the Fujita damage scale. Now, this is not a Kansas tornado, but was one that was very close by. Uh, Joplin, Missouri, May 22, 2011, and 158 people died. I include that here for a couple of reasons, one of which is I was actually chasing that day and drove through Joplin about six to eight minutes before the tornado actually arrived. This has is one of the deadliest tornadoes in American history, and what was really shocking about it was that I think many people in the severe weather community and many just people generally thought uh, warning systems had gotten so good that there would never be another tornado where you would have this many fatalities. Uh, but it does remind us that uh, tornadoes are in fact unpredictable, not entirely unpredictable, but we don't have them all figured out yet. We still don't understand why certain supercell thunderstorms will produce tornadoes and other ones don't. Um, I can certainly attest chasing this particular day that there was no indication that the storms that had been ongoing for several hours by the point of the Joplin tornado would produce a tornado like this. And so what I mean by that is I think among severe weather researchers and certainly among broadcasters and people who engage in warning the public, there's been kind of an end to complacency that we've got this warning system figured out. Because clearly when you lose 158 people, something did not go correctly, did not go right. Um, so I'll, I'll end here with just a few sort of more fun observations and then I'll return to the, the semi-serious point of this whole lecture. Uh, here are some photographs that I've taken over the years. Uh, June 20, 2011 out near Hill City, Kansas. You can actually see three different tornadoes uh, in this photograph. The one on the left eventually becomes more dominant and becomes that. Thankfully, this tornado didn't do any significant damage to any town, although it did damage several farms. Uh, and on the Great Plains and in Kansas, of course, we have a relationship with severe weather beyond just tornadoes. Um, I think people who live on the plains uh, come to embrace the lightning and the supercell thunderstorms like you see here as being uh, part of their birthright, as being Kansans and being citizens of the Great Plains. And when you go to other parts of the country, uh, I think lots of Kansans and lots of Plains people ultimately come to miss these phenomena. Mamatis. Uh, these tend to be on the back side of thunderstorms hanging down from the back sheared anvils of severe thunderstorms. Uh, another supercell up, this was actually in Nebraska. But you can tell this is an organized storm by the fact that it looks like it's almost man-made. It looks almost like a flying saucer, which again suggests the, the spin and the organization inside the thunderstorm. One of my favorite shots of all time, uh, back in Colorado, 1999. Glen Elder, Kansas, May 29, 2008. A large, wide tornado near dusk, surrounded by rain, hence the low quality of the image. A more classic tornado, April 2012, not too far from Abilene. Same tornado in its final stages of life, what we call the rope stage. But you, know, you can see how these how tornadoes can morph in their shapes, and that also gives them a certain kind of mystique and leads people to create fanciful stories as to why they do what they do. Another rope out from a different tornado in Nebraska back in 1998. Um, 
again, this is more just for your own information. We have gotten, of course, a lot better with uh, being able to diagnose tornadoes in real time as radar technology has improved, and you can now detect tornadoes uh, fairly well, particularly now with the latest generation of radar technology that can actually detect debris in the air, and not, not just the old school kind of hook echo that you see here. Uh, there are now, of course, ways for storm chasers in the field to report back real-time data. Uh, this was this was important on on uh, nights like uh, Greensburg, Kansas, uh, where you know the town of Greensburg was almost destroyed uh, by a violent F5 tornado. Uh, the impact of storm chasers being able to report what was going on in the field, and com combined with really excellent radar technology and experienced forecasters saved a lot of lives that night. And of course this is also kind of a, an interesting cultural response to severe weather. Uh, you have people like me who are storm chasers who have their own t-shirts and forget the language here but this is very much I think what you the way you would describe this vehicle. People actually with their customized chase vehicles like an old school El Camino or in this case a very expendable old station wagon. Or today uh, folks with more money than I ever will have, and perhaps less sense, trying to drive vehicles like this into tornadoes uh, to try to to gather information. All right. Well, the point here uh, of all of this, this entire lecture, is for you to understand that that connections between people and place, between Kansas and Kansans happens in ways you might not normally think of. And what I am trying to do here is suggest that Kansans' relationships with severe weather partially help make Kansans Kansans. Um, these stories about topographical legends, uh, these hills and valleys protecting your town from a tornado, this is a kind of psychological coming to grips with the physical realities of Kansas, the Kansas landscape, of Kansas weather. This is a theme, of course, we've dealt with throughout this class. People coming to Kansas and how then do you come to terms with aridity? How do you come to terms with extreme climate in a variety of ways? And in the case of tornadoes, we come to terms with it by embracing it, by making up stories that give us a false sense of security, by naming our high school mascots after them, by chasing them, by selling t-shirts about them and postcards. I mean, all of this is part of that coming to terms with severe weather as being a part of being Kansan, being different from people who live in the rest of the country. All right, uh, as always, if you have questions, uh, shoot me an email. And uh, as we are going through this semester in the spring, as always, keep your eyes to the sky. And we'll see you next time.